Thank you, Marty. As you can see, I'm very formal, um, so feel free to jump in with questions anytime. My plan is to break this into two parts. The first part will be where are we going, and the second part will be how did we get there, get here. And um, I'll take questions after the first part uh, and questions again after the second part. And as it says, the slides are available. It's at bit.ly, as in Libya, uh, slash SNE, as in Sinti, New England, 2015-05-14. And with my audio, it will be eventually posted on YouTube and on shubincafe.com. Okie doke. So enough of this island, Earth's interocitor. Uh, where are we going? In the near future, there seem to be two big trends. Uh, one is IP, as in inter Internet Protocol, and then more. This was the logo at the NAB convention this spring, Crave More. And then in the more distant future, oh, wow. So start with IP. Um, one school of thought is absolutely wonderful because you get to use commodity components like that 2499 router for uh, gigabit internet, including free shipping. Um, but that's only if you have an all IP facility. And if you don't, then you need some sort of adapters to go between the IP and the HDSDI at the very least. Um, this was a device that was at the NAB show. Uh, I couldn't get a price on it, but I looked up the replacement power supply price. That's 250 bucks. <laughs> Uh, IP is also wonderful because no central router is needed. That's a Cisco diagram, but there are differences of opinion. This is Everts's 46 terabit per second router that they showed first at last year's NAB. Um, they had 15 tons of air conditioning just for the router in its own little room. Um, and then... It maybe helps you uh, do what some people call at-home production. Uh, my favorite term for it is George Hoover at NAP. It's remoting the remote. And uh, here is a remote production truck, one that I am intimately familiar with, all mobile videos, Titan. And it's got a tremendous amount of equipment in it. But let's say all of the equipment in the truck could be reduced to a single chip what would happen to the size of the truck? That would be it. Because <laughs> there's all those people, and all the people need monitoring of video and audio and intercom, and um, they have control surfaces, and they generate heat, and so there's going to be air conditioning. So nothing changes in the size of the truck. But if you move all those people to every sports event or ballet or opera or whatever that's going on, um, and maybe you're paying $10,000 to get them there with hotels and transportation and so on, comes to a lot of money. Well, on site, you have to have A2s, you have to have utilities, you want to have maintenance, and you have to have stage managers, maybe talent. But is this trip really necessary for graphics, recording and playback, director, AD, TD, audio mixer, and camera operators? So... Um, just for hahas, this is at the Metropolitan Opera. This is under the stage. That's one of our camera operators. Um, but he's nowhere near a camera. He's a couple hundred feet away. Well, if it's a couple hundred feet, it could be a couple thousand miles. It's not that big a deal to remote that stuff. And, of course, the video operators are already remoted. Um, so the video control, the camera control, not so difficult to move around, but the output of 20 HD cameras or 4K cameras or 8K cameras, that turns into a lot of bits. Um, and big venue events tend to have the capacity to be able to send that back, like the Sochi Olympics went to NBC and they did control rooms in Stanford, Connecticut, instead of in Sochi. Um, but it's the little stuff where this would be really useful, where the same crew could do maybe three sports events in a day. They don't have the capacity for sending the stuff back yet. Now, a capacity issue, everyone says, oh, you know, 
internet is everywhere and people are cutting the cord and doing stuff like that. So here's an article that appeared in the New York Times. It has nothing to do with television uh, or not much to do with television. But as you can see from the headline, the sorry state of in-flight Wi-Fi. And what is the reason for the sorry state of in-flight Wi-Fi? That people are using it. <laughs> Mr. Chari said, almost 2 million passengers a month now connect to GoGo's wireless network in the air. Any given flight from Boston to Los Angeles will have 70 users. Well, that's why it doesn't work. <laughs> How dare all those people connect? Um, this was a more recent event, the Mayweather-Pacquiao uh, fight, and uh, it crashed many of the systems that were supposed to deliver it because there was too much demand. Um, and this is in my home when I was trying to watch an episode of Mozart in the Jungle on Amazon and it said there was an internet connection error and I'll blow that up a little bit. Uh, unable to connect at the moment, try again in a few minutes. And just to emphasize, try again in a few minutes. Well, you know, for Mozart in the Jungle, not so bad, take a break, uh, go eat something, come back. Um, but not everything is Mozart in the Jungle. So here, for example, was the recent Super Bowl, and um, this was an interception so that the score did not change with 20 seconds to go. Uh, because that's one where the score did not change. Here's an earlier example where the score did change. <laughs> Some of you old timers may remember this, the famous Heidi game, uh, Raiders versus Jets in 1968. With a minute one left, it was 7 p.m. Heidi was supposed to start. They couldn't contact the appropriate people. NBC said, okay, we go with Heidi. <laughs> the score at the time was Jets 32-29. Um, something amazing was happening at the game, and so NBC said, oh, we go back to the game. So they went back to the game, by which point the Raiders had won 43-32. <laughs> And meanwhile, the Heidi people are all ticked that their movie got interrupted. <laughs> um, so do we have to use the internet at all? Can we get directly to the brain? Some of you rem may remember the cerebrum communicator from the president's analyst in 1967. It's in a hypodermic to be injected directly into the brain. Um, James Coburn, the president's analyst, is stuck in a telephone booth there. Who knew that? In 2015, no one would know what a telephone booth is. <laughs> or that the phone company would not be the phone company anymore. Um, but can we control stuff directly from the brain? Well, I looked into this first in 1973. Battelle National Labs had done brain control. They had better than chance results. You could make things pan left, pan right, zoom in, zoom out, tilt up, tilt down. Uh, but the command stop worked best. Uh, more recently, you may have heard about Mind Reader for Google Glass last year. Um, and what it does, you think when you want to email a snapshot. And it will then post the <coughs> snapshot. So uh, IP is wonderful. This was an IP super session at NAB. And every single person on that um, stage was very much in favor of IP, uh, but not necessarily everyone in the audience. So someone brought up some stuff about standards, where even in the IP world, a Cisco router might have a different standard from someone else's uh, router. So mm, possibility versus the norm. We know there are IP facilities now. In 1961, President Kennedy called for a moon landing. In 1968, the movie 2001 predicted that Pan Am would have moon flights. In 1969, we actually had a moon landing. Uh, 1991, Pan Am went bankrupt. <laughs> 2001 came and went without moon service. Uh, 2014, ESPN opened an all IP facility. Well, sort of all IP. I mean, they're doing conversions to and from the IP to make it be an IP facility. And at 2015, IP was a buzzword at NAB. There's still no moon service. <laughs> what happens in the future remains to be seen. And uh, one final comment about the cloud before we move off of this completely. 
Um, there are non-technical considerations, things that have nothing to do with the technology, not even with the money. This guy you might remember, Kim.com, he had a company called Mega Upload. Mega Upload was involved in piracy, and so if you went to Mega Upload, this is what you saw. Uh, it said, we have seized this domain, and no one is allowed to use that anymore. And okay, you know, if he was engaging in bad behavior, the law came in and stopped him from doing his bad behavior. The problem was that he was posting his stuff on Carpathia and Cogent servers. And so when the government came in and shut him down, they shut them down. And if you had your photographs stored on a server that happened to have some mega upload stuff on it, you couldn't access your photographs or your videos. There were stories about artists who um, couldn't work because their facilities had been shut down. So one of the <coughs> issues, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but how do you even know whose basket it is? Um, Amazon has wonderful services that they're providing, cloud services, um, but they're providing them not only to consumers, they're providing them to other companies. So you go with cloudstorage.com and somebody at Amazon does something with child pornography and the government steps in and shuts that down and you decided, oh, I'm going to have two different systems, one on Amazon and one on cloudservers.com, and lo and behold, cloudservers.com was using Amazon, and you don't have access to your stuff anymore. So just be careful out there, as they used to say on Hill Street Blues. So the other big thought for the near future is more. Crave more. I like that this is a monster who just wants more, voracious. Uh, seems to want even more than Cookie Monster wanted. Um, so what kind of mores do we have? Well, more immersive images, more immersive sound, higher dynamic range, greater bit depth, which is not the same as higher dynamic range. I'll explain that in a moment. Wider color gamut, higher frame rate, and higher spatial resolution. Uh, the term UHD was originally meant for four times HD linear resolution in any direction. Uh, but now people refer to 8K or 4K. So here's one version of more immersive images. Uh, Barco has this system called Escape for movie theaters. That's the front screen, and then there's a side screen there, and a side screen there. Sounds like really cool new technology. Uh, Disney used it when they came out with Fantasia in 1940. <laughs> um, the first movie that had that was The Maze Runner last year. Um, and here is a paper about perception while watching movies, the effects of physical screen size and scene type. And I like the very detailed uh, diagram here, screen type, small, big. <laughs> And you can see that the mean subjective uh, presence goes up by these very fancy numbers and differently for faces and landscapes. Uh, but we do have an issue. This was a um, mobile show that was created, 24 Conspiracy, based on the TV show 24. And it was intended to be viewed on mobile phones back when mobile phones looked like that. And that was the screen. Um, so they had much tighter close-ups. Um, much more editing, uh, tighter framing, more blood, uh, bigger bullet holes so you could see this stuff. And the duration was typically three minutes. And the content was non-union actors because they couldn't afford to use union actors in it. Um, so uh, this doesn't translate directly to that very well. And there are some companies who say, oh, we make translation software or services. It's not so easy to do. This is a report that came out earlier this year uh, from Millward Brown. Uh, you can get it for free from them. Uh, it's called Getting Audiences Right. And uh, people say, well, you know, uh, millennials just use their smartphones and uh, boomers watch TV. And it's true that millennials use their smartphones a lot more than boomers do. And boomers watch TV a lot more than millennials do. But 77% of millennials watch TV. 
and 42% of boomers use smartphones. And regardless of who is using the smartphone, the preference for a smartphone falls after a five-minute task. So great for looking at your morning cat video, not necessarily so good for watching an opera. <laughs> this is, of course, the elephant in the room. <laughs> and in 2010, it was stereoscopic 3D. And that's an immersive technology. Um, why was it not so good in homes? Well, some people say there's an issue with glasses, there's an issue with group. Um, are you really together when you can't see anybody because you're wearing glasses? And do you have enough glasses for the group? And screen size matters because visual infinity should always be the spread of the interpupillary distance regardless of what the screen size is. So if you're looking at a smartphone and you're looking at something at infinity, it should be, say, 65 millimeters apart. And if you're looking at a movie theater screen and you're looking at something at infinity, it should be 65 millimeters apart. The reason I call that visual infinity is visual infinity starts at about 20 feet. Um, that's why when you go to the doctor and they have the eye chart, it's a 2020 vision because closer than 20, your lens is doing important things. Beyond 20, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then viewing distance matters also. So here is a chart of what's called uh, Percival's Zone of Comfort, and this is courtesy of Marty Banks at the Visual Space Perception Laboratory at Berkeley. And um, this particular new chart shows that at typical TV viewing distance, which is right around there, you're pretty good until something's going to bite you on the nose. Um, but the old chart and people who sit closer to TVs, let's say there's somebody sitting over there, they get out to something approaching visual infinity over here and they're out of the zone of comfort. And so that's why people were complaining about nausea and something, and that's even if it's absolutely perfect 3D TV. Um, Percival's zone of comfort says if you're looking at something up close, then infinity's a problem. And if you're gonna look at your smartphone, that's your smartphone viewing distance there. And so that's a problem starting about a meter out. Um, nevertheless, there's possibility for 3D without glasses, and this was a system in modern mechanics in 1931. Um, the neon tubes revolve, and uh, you get your 3D picture. Uh, in movie theaters, it actually happened and was very popular in Russia. Uh, this is a line for people to get into a 3D movie theater in Moscow, and here's one in St. Petersburg that's Cyrillic for stereo kino, or stereo movie theater, and there's the parallax bars being applied to a screen at the Moscow Stereo Kino in 1940. This was at NAB this year. Um, and this is virtual reality goggles. Now these have an advantage in that you can adjust the visual perception to whatever it's supposed to be. And you can always have visual infinity at the appropriate interpupillary distance regardless of how much, uh, what the size of the virtual screen is. And so that has possibilities for the home. Um, question is whether you want your home to look like that. <laughs> This is Google's version, by the way. Um, and uh, <laughs> the idea is that you take your smartphone and you stick it in there and then you look at it. Um, here's Immersive Sound. This is a German company, uh, Penguin Engineering Bureau. And um, they did some tests at IBC in 2013. I participated in them. And then at 2014, they presented a poster of their results. Uh, by the way, I also participated in some focus groups in the 1970s where we introduced stereo sound for the first time. And one of the comments from the focus groups was, gee, the picture is bigger. Um, so sound can have a strong effect. But what's interesting here in this poster is here's going from one-dimensional sound to three-dimensional sound, and 90% of the people say, oh yeah, that's definitely much better. Um, here's going from one-dimensional sound to two-dimensional sound, 84%, so 
not quite as much, 83%. Uh, but here's going from two-dimensional sound to three-dimensional sound. Now we're down to 60%. So you do get diminishing returns. When you are providing something significantly good, going to the next level doesn't necessarily give you the same kind of return. Here is um, a photograph in a ski lift, obviously not in the winter, and the tree over there is reasonably exposed. Uh, maybe it's, there's some overexposure in that section over there. Uh, now we'll open up the iris. Now we're really um, blooming on the trees. And if we go even a little wider, now we can see this stuff pretty well, but we don't even know what's out there. There's some little green, maybe that's trees. Um, so that's an issue of high dynamic range. The world has much higher dynamic range than what we can present on a screen. Here is a demonstration at JBC at NAB um, this year. And uh, side by side, that's high dynamic range. That's regular. Obviously, my camera and this display can't give you the high dynamic range. But I'll tell you, there was no clipping here. So you're seeing speculars at something approaching what those speculars should look like. And here is an image. Some of you might have seen this before. Um, the only light in this room is coming from this lamp that's pointed right into the lens. And yet we can see every chip on the chip charts without any difficulty. Um, and if I zoom in on the filament, you can see every coil of the filament in that same image. So from the darkest chip to the brightest coil. That was shown at NAB in 2008 by Peter Senton of Grass Valley. And it's the Grass Valley Sensium sensor. It's what they've been using in their cameras for quite some time. This is a 10 million to 1 contrast ratio in this image, uh, or more than 23 stops. Have they implemented it in a camera yet? Answer, no. <laughs> Maybe at IBC this coming year. Um, there are other companies, uh, Lux Media Plan is one of them, that implemented the high dynamic range of that sensor, but Grass Valley hasn't yet. Now, um, let's talk for a moment about um, spatial resolution. When HD cam first came out, when Sony introduced HD cam and they found it would be very problematic to be able to record a 422 HD video signal, uh, what they did was they changed it from 422 to 311. They went only up to 1440 in the Luma and only up to 640 in the Chroma, but not too many people noticed. And the reason for that is sharpness is affected by the area under a curve that plots contrast against resolution. We call that an MTF curve or modulation transfer function. The modulation is the contrast. Um, there are two schools of thought about how this affects sharpness. The RCA and Sony school, which I tend to agree with, says it's the square of the area under the curve. And Zeiss and Ari say it's the area under the curve. But either way, if that's 1440 and that's 1920, there's not a lot of area under the curve that you're losing. So losing a significant chunk of resolution, but not so much in the sharpness. So what happens if we do high dynamic range? Well, let's say we just get a better lens so we can increase the MTF over here. Now we've increased the area. We've doubled the area. Uh, just in that section. That's pretty significant. What if we go to true high dynamic range, so everything goes up? Now we've got a huge amount more area under there. So tremendous amount more sharpness without changing the spatial resolution at all. So um, this was presented at last year's NAB show at the Technology Summit on Cinema. This is from the uh, Swiss um, Polytechnic um, uh, school in Lausanne, and the numbers are almost identical to what the EBU found. Uh, the only reason I'm showing this one is I got the EBU stuff pre-publication, and so I wasn't allowed to show it. Uh, but basically the same thing. So here is your reference monitor at 100 nits, and here is today's TVs, something around between 350 and 900 nits. 
um, and then this would be some hypothetical 4,000 nit monitor. And uh, you get a full grade of improvement just going from 100 nits to 400 nits. And then pretty much another grade of improvement going from 400 nits to 1,000 and another half grade uh, going from 1,000 to 4,000. Um, to give you an idea of what's happening in a cinema, um, in a cinema, um, 48 is peak white. And if you're watching 3D, maybe you're getting 12 out of peak white. Um, so the numbers are kind of different. The display issues for this are not trivial. Now, Carl earlier was talking about how uh, wonderful high dynamic range is. I agree completely. You can see it from across the room, outside the room. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, but getting there, power consumption. If you're doing just specular, is no problem. Your TV isn't going to draw much more than your current TV does. But then on comes a commercial with a white field. And you now violate California law because your TV is drawing too much power. Uh, heat dissipation. This is Dolby's Pulsar monitor versus a regular monitor over there. This is the 4,000 nit test monitor. It's liquid cooled. Um, when they did their testing for cinema and they had expert viewers and stuff, there were drapes that covered up everything back here, so all you saw was this little screen. But that little screen is ground glass. You're looking straight into a digital cinema projector. Yeah. Uh, and that's how they were able to achieve 20,000 nits. Um, not too many people are going to do that at home, I don't think. So not trivial, but quite wonderful. Now, the bit depth issue and why it's not the same as high dynamic range. High dynamic range is the range between the brightest thing you have and the darkest thing you have, period. And if you engineer it properly, meaning you have at least um, one half LSB of noise, then the only thing affected by the bit depth is the signal to noise ratio. It has nothing to do with the dynamic range. But practically, because people haven't engineered stuff uh, correct, it causes contouring. And we'd like to get rid of the contouring, and it's halved per extra bit that you put in. And uh, when the contouring gets to the point of one half LSB matching uh, the noise, then the contouring goes away. So now let's look at color. Um, Physiologically, this is the range of colors that we can see, not the particular colors that you're seeing there, but the spectrum going around the outside. This is a CIE uh, chromaticity diagram. And uh, a hypothetical ideal uh, three primary display would have one corner at that corner and one corner at that corner and uh, something up there. That's the maximum area you can get out of this. You're still losing all of those colors on the sides there. And uh, most of them maybe not so significant. This is the color of Salem Cigarettes package. And that was always something that really bothered them. Uh, Carl was talking about being called in. Why is what the artist doing, not what's appearing on the TV set? Uh, so that's a long time problem. So here, this is a diagram from an Extron uh, site, and they're showing the new standard ITU-RBT2020, and it's pretty close to that ideal. Um, and the red in particular is just astonishing um, when you see it. And this is ITU-R709, roughly what we have now. Um, so it sounds like, wow, you know, wider color gamut's going to do exciting stuff. So Here's a company um, called Genoa Color Technologies, and they provide systems with more than three primaries. So they try to give you some of that stuff that you otherwise couldn't get. They have five primary systems and six primary systems. And here's a demonstration they did. Um, and uh, there's this sock or whatever it is over there. And there's a conventional monitor with RGB. And there's the Genoa monitor. and you know, you can all see this matches what's there and that one doesn't, right? But there's a problem. You're looking at an RGB projector. So, caveat emptor. 
oh, um, before I get off of that, um, when you go to five subpixels or six subpixels, then you're messing with the resolution also. Now, here's some incorrect color decoding. Um, let's say we shot something in Rec 601 and we decode it as 709, and if I put the color bars there, I think you can all see that there's differences between the two. But here is shot in 601 decoded as 709. This is what it's supposed to be. That shot in 709 decoded as 601. Yes, there are some subtle differences there. Um, is anybody at home going to say anything about this? No, absolutely not. Here is the worst possible thing I could do. I've taken away the red completely. Anyone want to guess what color that woman's top really is? Anyone? What's it look like? Orange. Yellow. <laughs> yellow, okay. And sure enough, if I put the red back, she's wearing a yellow top. We can figure out all kinds of stuff. But now I'm going to get rid of the red only on her top. So you'll see what the color was before. That's what you were looking at and everyone in the room said that was yellow. Well, somebody yellow. said it was orange. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we're very good at telling color differences in small areas. We're either terrible or wonderful, depending on your point of view, in large areas. Uh, you know, it's wonderful in that we can say the apple is red, whether you're looking at it under daylight or you're looking at it under uh, blue light or something. Um, but giving a wider color gamut, you know, maybe the first instant that somebody sees it, it's very exciting. So here's the HPA Tech Retreat this year in February, and this is Jan Freilich of um, Dolby, and that's some test material that he was showing projected by a Christie laser projector that does almost the full BT2020. There's a tiny bit in the blue that it doesn't quite match, but uh, basically, it's the entire thing. And everyone say, wow, you know, amazing reds in there. In fact, when they were just setting up the projector, if they just put up a red field, they were like, oh, I've never seen a red anything like that before. It was amazing. But, you know, then they put on some real movies, and okay, look like real movies. Um, this is the projector, by the way, and it's a magnificent machine. Because they have so many laser sources, there is no scintillation. Uh, scintillation is um, a little uh, kind of moving dot thing that you tend to see in laser projection, and it's actually being caused in your eye. It's not being caused by the projector. You can shoot the projection with a camera and it won't see it, but your eye sees it. Um, but by having a bunch of different laser sources, and they're all slightly different, uh, the Christie projector gets rid of that problem. Uh, another thing that was shown at the HPA Tech Retreat, I don't have it in a slide here, uh, was from RealD, the 3D company. They've come up with a new screen, um, and it vibrates better than other screens can vibrate, and so it gets rid of the scintillation by doing that. So when Christy was doing this, so many people had seen the RealD demo that people walked up to touch the screen. It was very strange seeing this line of people touching the projection screen, but they didn't see the scintillation and there wasn't any movement. Yes? Is that the same as Speckle? Uh, yeah. You can call it uh, laser speckle. Um, so it's high dynamic range, high output, can do almost full BT2020. So that's maybe a display that would do it in a movie theater if we decide that that's something good in the movie theater. Carl was saying earlier about how 24 frames per second maybe helps with suspension of disbelief. Maybe the low brightness that we have is also something that's helpful. So we are at a SIMPTI event, and I want to emphasize the M in SIMPTI. We deal with motion. And so why should we care about frame rate? Well, one reason that people over history cared about frame rate was flicker. Um, but now we have displays that can display essentially constantly, and there's no necessary relationship between the motion frame rate and the display frame rate. So we need apparent motion. You all probably see something going around there, even though all that's happening is different dots are flashing, either purple or green. Um, there's motion smoothness, and then there's stuff that interacts with motion smoothness. So I will now demonstrate flicker. 
So you just saw flicker. If we have stuff that's too slow, we see flicker. But this projector is projecting that white uh, that you're looking at uh, probably at 120 um, flashes per second, and you're not noticing that. So depending on peripheral vision, depending on uh, brightness, uh, we tend to max out someplace around 70 flashes per second. And um, one of the reasons that things are darker in movie theaters is if you're going to watch 24 frames per second, you need it to be dark uh, because otherwise you'll perceive the flicker, even though you're watching with effectively a double-bladed shutter or uh, the equivalent of that in digital projection. So here is something you can see on the uh, Franklin Institute website. This is one frame per second, not really good for apparent motion. Um, in a moment, it's going to go to five frames per second. Okay, that's, you know, you can tell that there's motion there. It's maybe not the smoothest thing you ever saw, but definitely motion. And there's 15 and absolutely motion. So you don't really need a particularly high frame rate for most real-world motion. And what I've just shown you was without any temporal filtering. If I did filtering, then even the five uh, frames per second would look very smooth. I could maybe even make the one frame per second look pretty smooth. But when things get fast enough, then it isn't necessarily good. So here's the uh, noted wagon wheel effect. And you're going to see artifacts of my computer and this projector in addition to the wagon wheel effect. But um, clearly something different is happening in the outer ring from what's happening in the inner ring. And as it gets even faster, you'll start th seeing things move in different directions. Uh, one of them seems to be moving that way. The other one seems to be moving that way. So that's not good, but that's a result of aliasing. We're sampling at a rate that's too low, and we're not filtering for it. And you can do temporal filtering that will get rid of that. I'll just let this run to the end so you can see the credit from Pixel Maniac. So if you're here in the room, you wouldn't see that? Yeah, you, um, if you were looking at it, uh, no, you wouldn't. You would just see a blur. You wouldn't see any of those lines at all. The reason for the lines is that there's sampling going on that's too fast. So um, here's something that interacts with um, motion smoothness, and it's dynamic resolution. Now, to get a picture like this, all I need to do is shorten the exposure. Doesn't matter what the frame rate is, I could go to a thousandth of a second exposure and get really sharp picture. Notice that the ties and the tracks have identical resolution in the top and the bottom, but the train doesn't. Um, this is 50 frames per second and that's 300 frames per second. So if I want to have smooth motion and high dynamic resolution, then that seems like I need to go to a higher frame rate. But if I just want the dynamic resolution, I can go to a short exposure. And if I just want the smooth motion, I can go to high filtering. This is a picture courtesy of Pete Luday. Uh, people talk about 4K. He says, ain't no 4K information there. Um, and here's a frame from an artwork. It's, uh, the artist's name is James Nairs, and the artwork is called Street. And uh, I did make a bit.ly of this, but I don't remember what it was. Um, but just look up James Nair's Street, and you can watch a two-minute excerpt. He has this thing goes on for, I think, more than an hour. What he did was he just rode around New York City streets um, with a camera pointed perpendicular to his car, like shooting out one of the side windows. Um, and it was a vision research camera, and he was shooting at a high frame rate. And it's some of the sharpest stuff you ever saw. You look at it and you go, wow, you know, is that 4K? Is that 8K? And all it is is stuff that was shot at a higher frame rate, and so it has higher dynamic resolution. So this year's elephant in the room is 4K. This is last year's NAB, and this was the Utilsat booth, and they said broadcasting more than 5,000 TV channels, of which 500 are in high definition, to which I add... The other 4,500 are not 4K. 
<laughs> and in February of this year, Russians NTV, Russia's NTV just started transmitting HD. So a lot of people aren't yet even at HD, let alone 4K. So why 4K? Um, there's two main theoretical reasons. One is better pictures, and the other, as Carl mentioned, is the ability to zoom in by a factor of two to one for HD. Well, does it really give you better pictures? Not in economic terms. Here are the top five movies of last year. American Sniper, Hunger Games, Guardians of the Galaxy, Captain America, <laughs> and the Lego movie. Okay, the Lego movie was animation. The other four were all shot on Ari Alexa, except Captain America had a little bit that was shot with Red Epic. The Ari Alexa is 2880 by 1620. It's not even 3K. And yet, consistently, movies that were shot with the Ari Alexa end up at the top of the box office charts because people don't care about higher resolution. What they like is high dynamic range. They like um, certain artifacts that certain cameras give you. Ari has done a lot of great thinking about this, and people like to shoot in Ari Alexa. Here's another one of Pete Luday's things. There's a movie, and again, his comment. Uh, no 4K information there because Virtually all computer graphics are rendered in 2K, not 4K. Here is a display that I loved at NAB this year. They called it the world's smallest 8K display, a 55-inch 8K set. Um, and I just spent minutes and minutes and minutes standing there like two inches away and looking at it. Absolutely fantastic up close. But at home viewing distance, when I was coming down the aisle, look like an HD monitor. So here is what typical 8K viewing looks like. <laughs> That's not necessarily bad. You know, there are applications where that might be great. You want to have uh, a point of sale display or something. And everybody, wow! It, 8K sucks you up to the monitor. Um, but if you're not up against the monitor, if you're sitting in your easy chair, then it looks like HD unless it's really, 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 really big, and maybe not even then. But there's other applications. You know, Maybe you're a doctor and you're looking at x-rays. So you'd love to have 8K resolution so you can look really close and see those x-rays. But for entertainment, it's a different issue. Excuse me, aren't yes. some of these uh, big sporting events uh, being considered to be done 4K? So Why are they being considered to be done 4K? Yeah. Um, because the people who make the 4K equipment are paying for it. Um, three events coming up this year are going to be in the United States are going to be done in 8K. Um, and you can guess which Japanese network is sponsoring that stuff. Um, so I've shown you these viewing um, charts. And here's another one. This is EBU testing of HD versus 4K. These are HD, that's 720p, that's 1080i, that's 1080p. Um, the red line is uh, at a typical viewing distance, 2.7 meters or 9 feet. And the black line is at one and a half times the screen size, screen height. Uh, for, so for a 56-inch screen, that's 40 inches away from the screen. Um, and there is a statistically significant difference. There's no question that the 4K is a little better. Um, at home viewing distance, it seems to be about a third to a quarter of uh, a grade. So that would be a full grade. That's a half grade. So, you know, I don't know, quarter of a grade or something. And if you're 40 inches away, it's about half a grade. The other option, somebody was saying, well, you can go to a really big screen. So here's a 4K, 293-inch screen. Um, if you don't mind your television set being 12 feet high, um, you can get one of those. So now let me put all three of those viewing tests together and normalize the vertical scale. And now the distance from the top is the greatest improvement. So there's 4K at home viewing distances, quarter of a grade of improvement. There's high frame rate, and for every doubling of frame rate, you get a full grade of improvement. So this requires 16 times the data per grade of improvement. This is two times the data per grade of improvement. And there's 
um, higher dynamic range, going from 100 to 400 again, uh, about a full grade of improvement there. And how much that requires in data rate, well, it depends on whether you need more bit depth or not. So if you don't need any bit depth, you're at zero, and if you need some bit depth, maybe 20% extra data, something like that. So it definitely is an improvement, no question about it, but it's not a big improvement. And again, as Carl said, I urge you to go down to CBS and see the demo. Yes, sir? How are you measuring rate of improvement? Um, there's a an ITU spec for um, the grade scale and exactly how you do it and what lamp you put behind the TV for backlighting and everything. So it's a pretty formalized thing. They have viewers come in and they say whether something looks perfect or uh, is impaired or is noticeably impaired or is bothering you. But it's based on, on subjective. Correct. But it's, it's multiple viewers. Yeah. And the other thing is that, as I showed you, this one is the Swiss Polytechnic Institute. These happen to be EBU. But everybody who's done tests comes up with pretty much the same thing. You know, maybe a tiny change in the slope, but about the same. Maybe you should use grade for what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's also interaction between these things. So let's say if you have the American Cinematographer Manual, it talks about panning speeds. Um, for different uh, films and so on. Um, so let's say you decided that a good panning speed would be one pixel per second or something like that. Um, well, if you go from HD to 4K, you're now moving at two pixels per second, even though you said it was one pixel per second if you're doing the same panning. So that's what this chart is for. Um, if you had no filtering and you were doing 720p HD, um, then at 120 frames per second, you could go completely across the screen in 10.7 seconds with no aliasing whatsoever. If you do that at 4K at 24 frames per second, it's 171 seconds. So big difference there. The other interesting interaction is between high dynamic range and frame rate. So this is, again, from the Visual Space Perception Laboratory uh, at Berkeley. And this was done for 3D, but it doesn't really matter that it's for 3D. Um, if you don't have sufficient frame rate, then you have aliasing. And that's what these lines are. The stuff that you want is within the red oval that I've added here. So that's what you want, and this other stuff is what you don't want. But notice that not everything is black. Some of it fades off. And so the aliases that are faded aren't that obvious. But if we increase the dynamic range, we make them more obvious. And so if you go to any of the Dolby demos of their high dynamic range system, first thing is you're blown away. Wow, you know, that's amazing dynamic range. And second thing is, wow, that was really shot badly because there's so much motion judder. Um, so something to consider. Uh, high frame rate seems to be the most significant improvement uh, in that it doesn't bother anything else, but then there's what Carl was saying about the suspension of disbelief, but maybe that's just something we're accultured to. So if you're not getting that much improvement out of 4K, how about this other thing? Shoot 4K, but release in HD, and you can zoom in by a factor of two. So here we have a uh, typical football game, and let's say I wanted to zoom in and uh, see if this guy is tripping that guy over there. Um, so I can zoom in by another factor of two because that's uh, 3840 across, and this is only 1920 across. And as far as the camera is concerned, and as far as the math is concerned, and the pixels are concerned, that's all correct. But that's not all you have to deal with because cameras have lenses. And so here is an HD zoom lens. This is a really high-end HD zoom lens, uh, one of the finest I've ever used. And this is HD at 100 uh, line pairs per millimeter for two-thirds inch format. And so 4K is a little bit beyond the 200 over there. Uh, 200 would be 3840. That would be 4096 over there. Um, so. Uh, this is the center modulation transfer function, so at HD in the center getting, I don't know, 75% uh, contrast. Um, but as 
I'm down at the bottom of the picture. Um, you know, I'm getting maybe 35% contrast at HD, but at 4K, I'm down to 10% contrast. So that's like a quarter of the contrast. So if I do that zoom in, if I do that two to one zoom in, I've lost so much contrast that the sharpness of my picture has gone way south. And some of the people who were shooting sports and zooming in from 4K to 2K have now acknowledged that. Others are saying, oh no, you know, it's still really cool. So, okay, I'm not gonna say they're wrong. And then here's a press release that came out at NAB for an 8K camera. And it says, oh, by the way, and you can use a system expander to put one of those HD lenses on the 8K camera. So I leave you to do your own extrapolation out to 8K, which would be at 427 line pairs per millimeter. So here's a common HD field camera lens combination. And that mount is one of the most standardized things in our industry. Uh, the standard is BTA S1005A, and it standardizes not only the mechanical mount, but also the color depths of the three colors, which are different, um, because there's uh, longitudinal chromatic aberration, and so they're different by five microns or 10 microns, depending on the color, and not the way that you might think. Um, so here's looking at the camera's sensor. Now, I'm only showing four of the photo sites, there would be 1920 by 1080 of these, but each photo site is five micrometers wide and five micrometers high. And everyone has basically agreed that that's a good size because light has noise. Aside from anything that happens after it gets into your camera, the light itself has noise, sometimes called shot noise or photon noise. And so you need a fairly large photo site five microns by five microns is <laughs> relatively not so large, but um, that allows you to integrate that noise enough and get a decent signal to noise ratio. So the first people to come out with a 4K camera, uh, which was Lockheed Martin in the year 2000, just upscaled a regular video camera. They went to a large prism, they went to really large CCDs, um, but that meant that there was a very large camera. So that's not something you're going to put on your shoulder. So the second approach, um, and this is what Carl showed you before, the Bayer filter, um, it's to take a single sensor and put color filters on top. But when you do that, you have some problems. For one thing, as Carl mentioned, the red and the blue have only 2K resolution, assuming it's a 4K sensor. The green sort of has 4K resolution. It has 4K resolution horizontally and vertically, but it doesn't have 4K resolution diagonally. We can go down those whites uh, in any of those diagonals and not have anything register. Now, one problem with that is you can't have a perfect uh, optical low-pass filter. If you have something that's going to eliminate aliases in the red or the blue, it's going to get rid of resolution in the green. And if you have something that's wide enough so that you have good resolution in the green, then it's letting aliases in on the red and the blue. Another thing is you need to have up conversion because the red and the blue are just 2K. And if you're gonna make them 4K, you have gotta up convert. Now you can call it all kinds of different names. You don't necessarily have to call it up conversion, but you gotta do it. And if the chip is just 3840 or even 4096 across, it's not delivering 4K because of the color filtering. Now, there are some people with higher resolution chips, notably Sony. Um, they have like 20 megapixels instead of eight. So they get better performance out of that. But some people, anybody who has what they call a 4K resolution chip is not delivering 4K. So this was the size side of the red booth at NAB this year. And there's a quote from Jim Gennard in uh, 2006, up resing not spoken here. And what I thought of that is it's kind of like the controversy in Florida that you're not allowed to say the words climate change. So okay, we can't say up resing. You could say upscaling, up conversion, debayering, demosaicing, but whatever you call it, there's up resing in there. There's also some lens considerations. Now, most of these single sensor cameras have a super 35 um, millimeter size uh, sensor, and so they're using the common 35 millimeter mount, PL mount. 
and they tend to use prime lenses, and that's all fine. No problem with any of that. The larger format tends to mean narrower depth of field, which is sometimes great if you're shooting a movie. It's nice to have the background be out of focus, um, but not necessarily so good if you're shooting news or sports. Um, and if you're shooting sports, a lot of people say, oh, you know, go ahead and use your um, regular HD lens, your long zoom, and there's an adapter for it. But if you use an adapter from a two-thirds inch format lens to a Super 35 sensor, and everything is perfect, let's say it's the world's most perfect adapter, then it loses 2.6 stops of light, which is like 600% more light needed. Not insignificant. And again, the lens MTF is just HD. So um, at NAB this year, the five manufacturers of field cameras, the kind of stuff that's used for sports, um, all came out with approaches for doing 4K with two-thirds inch lenses. And they all had different approaches. So, well, four of them had different approaches. Um, Panasonic, uh, in the AKUC 3000, they came out with a one-inch format. And I've drawn this to scale compared to the other stuff. So it's bigger than two-thirds, but smaller than Super 35. So the optical reduction is just 16 elevenths, which means you're not losing 2.6 stops, you're losing less than that. But they're basically putting the adapter inside the camera, so it's got a B4 mount on the front. Uh, and because the adapter is inside the camera, the electrical controls allow the use of the lens correction that Panasonic does, so the chromatic aberration correction and so on can still work. Option number three, um, and this was done by both Ikigami and Sony, three CMOS sensors, true 4K, two-thirds inch. So these are true 4K cameras, no upconversion. These are the only 4K cameras existing today, uh, not counting the Lockheed Martin prototype, that do not require any upconversion. So it sounds great. Um, and from a resolution standpoint, it's wonderful but they're two-thirds inch sensors. And that means that we're no longer five microns by five microns, we're now two and a half microns by two and a half microns. So that's a quarter of the area. And that means that you're losing either sensitivity or signal to noise ratio, or both depending on how you want to deal with it. And again, light has noise. So is two and a half by two and a half good enough? We will see. Uh, another approach from Hitachi in the SKUHD 4000, which they introduced at IBC last year, uh, last fall, um, they've added another light splitting element to the prism. So instead of splitting the, the light three ways, it splits it four ways. And they have two green sensors. They're using HD sensors. And they offset one of the greens by half a pixel diagonally. So they use Bayer-like processing to derive 4K out of that. Um, very nice, you can have proper optical filtering. The only problem with this one is that extra splitting of the light. Um, so there is a bit of a sensitivity hit there too. Um, option five, this is very interesting from Grass Valley. This is the LDX86, their 4K camera. Uh, it's an HD camera. It's got three HD sensors, prism, totally Everything up to the end of the camera is a total HD camera. So how do they get away with calling it 4K? Well, since most of the people with 4K cameras are doing some kind of upconversion, they're doing upconversion. And while their upconversion doesn't have any assist by having the Bayer processing that you can do, on the other hand, everything optically is perfect. The lens matches, the optical low-pass filter matches, the prisms match the uh, sensors match, and because everything matches, they can do a better up conversion. So they'll take the output of their camera and show it to you compared to somebody else's 4K <coughs> camera. Um, so those are the options now, and you pays your money and you takes your choice. But what's nice is, with the four, five manufacturers of field cameras all going to two-thirds inch 4K, the lens manufacturers take note. So Canon says, okay, here's our prototype, and Fuji introduced two new products, the UA 22 by 8, which is this guy over here, and the UA 80 by 9, which is this guy over here. 
and these are wonderful lenses. So there's the HD lens, there's the 4K lens. Look at the difference in the MTF. It's pretty amazing. And um, I've drawn in HD because nobody says you can't use this lens on an HD camera. Right. Mm -hmm. So stick that lens on an HD camera. We've now gone even in the center from 72% MTF to 85% MTF. And down at the bottom from 35% MTF to 65% MTF. As we say in New England, wicked shop. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is an amazingly wonderful lens. It also has more transmission because they've come up with a new coating. There's a different optical design. There's less reflection. And shifted peak performance. This is an interesting thing you might not think about. The typical HD lenses that we have today, um, as the apertures get smaller, they're limited by diffraction. But as the apertures get larger, they're limited by the sidle aberrations. And so there's some point where those two curves match, and that's where the peak performance of the lens is. And on today's HD lenses, that tends to be around f4. On this, it's at f1.8. Wow. So the lens actually performs better when it's wider open. How much? Um, <laughs> to be discussed. <laughs> Uh, in theory, the new optical design actually could conceivably make it cheaper, but I don't think that's going to happen for a while. <laughs> so, a quarter million dollars? Well, uh, the HD lenses, the high-end HD lenses today are around 100000 for the good stuff, so, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Discuss it with your lens manufacturer. <laughs> But do we even need lenses, or can we do something completely different? So now let's move into the slightly farther future. Um, ignore the camera here. This is a black magic, but it doesn't matter what the camera is. All I'm trying to do is make a point here. We can move the camera around for position. We can focus zoom iris uh, on the lens. Uh, we can um, get different depth, and there are aberrations that are introduced by the lens. That's all from this point back. But in front of that lens, we have what's called a light field. And that's before we've messed with it. We're not focusing it or anything. Like what's in front of my face right now is everything in this room. And I can do this and look around you. And I can see how far back you are. Um, and um, I can make out bright stuff outside and dark stuff in here um, because I'm dealing with just the light field that's in front of me. So what can you do in post if you can somehow capture the light field? Well, you can bring anything you want into focus. You can choose the focal distance in post. You can choose the depth of field in post. You can change the iris in post. You can reposition the camera in post. You can derive depth info, and from that depth info, what was shown at NAB this year is you can actually relight the scene in post. So let me show you a little more of that. So here are three light field techniques. This is commercially available. It's the Lytro camera. Uh, just takes still pictures, uses kind of a fly's eye lens. Um, this is Fraunhofer's early six camera array. This was at NAB in 2013. And this is something we developed at M uh, MIT in 2006, I think it was, called a coded aperture. And the MIT coded aperture is very simple. You basically just take a lens, knock out the existing aperture, stick in the coded aperture. And because you know what the shape of those holes are and the geometry of them, you can find the null point in the light field and recreate it. So the, oh, 2007 is the MIT thing. These pictures are from MIT. This is done in post after the photograph was taken, changing the focus from the foreground to the background. I think you can see that was done very effectively. And then here's Fraunhofer, and they're doing a camera move. So you can see the edge of this thing here, and it's been blocked by the chair there. And again, that was done in post. So that's all stuff that we've known about for a while. Um, this is one of the Fraunhofer light field cameras. It's not critical what the distances are or anything or how many. They've sometimes done arrays of four by five. The more cameras, the the more accuracy you have and stuff. But to get a good looking picture, what they're doing here is arranging a 3D rig so there will be 
a beam splitter glass there, and this is the light field array, and then this is a Sony high-end uh, digital cinema camera. So previously shown, you can do high dynamic range because you can effectively set the iris on each of these cameras to a different point. You can do stereo 3D in post because you have lots of different views. Um, refocus in post I just showed you. Reframing I just showed you. Re-iris, again, based on the different cameras have different iris. But here's the new stuff, relighting in post. So, um, if we can do that on a small scale, how about on a top scale? Now, you just saw an aerial view of the field, but that's coming from these six cameras, not one of which is above the field. But they are providing enough information to define the 3D space where these people are playing, and so you can fly a camera overhead, and you can have nice detail because at some point, the players are going to turn around and the computer is going to figure out what was going on. This is a European project, Project Fine. Um, I was actually on the advisory board for them. And you'll see an actual TV show that they did in a moment. The first time I saw them, uh, it was taking about um, 10 minutes to do a frame. And then the second time I saw them, they were in real time. So again, that shot, there is no camera that has that angle. But you can reposition a virtual <coughs> camera anywhere you want. So we not only don't need to have uh, lenses, we also don't necessarily need to have cameras. And what if you want to show viewers some stuff? This was another Project Fine thing. I had nothing to do with this one. So some possibilities for the future. And then other forms of computational imaging. Uh, one is light field processing, as I mentioned, but another is deconvolution. Um, now, if you have an image that's blurred, it could be blurred because the lens wasn't in focus. It could be blurred because the camera was moving, uh, bouncing up and down. The exposure was too long, whatever. If you know what caused that blurring? If you have all the information about that, then you can do known deconvolution, and that gets you from this to this. So that's the original. That's what happened after the processing. But if you don't even know anything about it, you just have a blurry picture, you can still figure out through blind deconvolution and go from that to that. Um, we also have the possibility of having a flat lens. This is something that they've been working on at Harvard. This lens is 60 nanometers thick. That's a very, very thin lens, and yet it has no chromatic aberration whatsoever. Um, getting rid of chromatic aberration was the first computational imaging, and that's one nice thing about 8K. Uh, it was developed for 8K cameras because they couldn't possibly get the lens to be good enough initially. Um, here is something called the Quanta Image Sensor, and this records, rather than something called pixels, uh, something he's calling jots, and it records maybe 100 gigajots, and it does it maybe 1,000 times a second. And uh, you could say, okay, this guy's a crackpot. Um, the only difficulty with calling him a crackpot, it's Eric Fossum, and he designed the um, active matrix uh, CMOS sensors that are in just about everything. <laughs> So I tend to listen to him when he says he's got a new idea. And then here's a new thing, a silicon retina. Now, uh, this is conventional. He's got one of those little spinning toys. And you saw the black dot when it was stationary. And um, when it moves around, you don't see it. It gets blurry. And it's the same thing you would have seen. If you held it in front of yourself, you would just see it blurring. Uh, so that's the conventional one. And then. Here is the retinal imager. Now, our retinas respond to change. 
They respond to a contrast change or a temporal change or something. So he's now switched the sensor into retinal mode, and you can see the dot moving around. And this is not a higher frame rate. This is just the retina responding to change and whatever change is happening. So if somebody's moving very slowly across, it's going to respond to that change. If a rocket goes by, it's going to respond to that change. Um, very interesting stuff. And then uh, here is a trillion frame per second camera, and what you're seeing is a pulse of light passing through a Coca-Cola bottle. That was done at MIT some years ago. This was uh, from a 2012 TED Talk. And again, the motion issues of my computer, not the system. And there's a quick femtosecond uh, pulse of light, and we're watching it slowed down by a factor of 10 billion to 1. Um, two Japanese universities have now gone up to 4.4 trillion frames per second, so they've gone four times what MIT was doing. But another advantage of this system is you could fire light from the camera. Just think of it as a camera-mounted light. And then if you fire this in a femtosecond, then the light bounces off there. It bounces off something someplace else, bounces back over here, gets into the camera. And through the computational imaging, you can figure out what is in that area of bounce. And if you go to the... Um, URL that I put in for that TED talk, you'll see the camera can see around corners. 